Hi there. Welcome back to Bush History. I'm David Bush. This is the eighth topic in my continuing series in American history. So far we've gone through the American Revolution, the beginning of the American system, and the age of Jackson. And now we're up to kind of the background or an understanding of what's going to lead us towards the Civil War and eventual secession. We're going to take a look at slavery. This, uh, this presentation is actually going to be four or five separate smaller presentations on the relationship between the North and the South and how slavery actually ties them together and then rips them apart. It goes both ways. So this is going to be topic eight. Topic eight, slavery, the North and the South, or the South and the North. So if you want to take a look at the companion note set, you go on www.bushhistory.net and you look in the YouTube folder, so slash YouTube. And one of the, uh, one of the interesting things about uh, slavery and the South and the North is I was taught when I was in elementary school, the South bad, the North good. The South likes slavery, the North hates slavery. And that the Civil War was fought over slavery. Complete lies, completely a ridiculous notion. And that's what I'm going to take a look at as we go through this because the bottom line is, <clears throat> kind of giving the punchline away before I finish the whole topic, but the cotton that the South was growing, produced on plantations, was being shipped to the North, and the North was taking that cotton and turning it into finished goods, clothing, and a variety of textiles. So the North was dependent on Southern, southern cotton and the South was dependent on slavery to grow that cotton, so the North was also dependent on slavery. This idea that the North was all anti-slavery and the South was all pro-slavery, kind of ridiculous. And I'm going to try to dispel a lot of those myths as we go forward. So if you take a look for a second, I'd like to show you how this is going to proceed. Uh, certainly when you talk about the relationship between the North and the South, they actually needed each other. The, Growth of cotton in the United States as an export crop really meant that we were going to become the Saudi Arabia of the world in terms of cotton, where Saudi Arabia is to oil, the South was to cotton in the first half of the 1800s. We were the number one cotton producing area in the entire world. Later on it would be Egypt, but right now it's the United States between 1800 and about 1860. And our number one consumer was Europe primarily England. So we're exporting a lot of stuff to England, a lot of cotton, specifically to England. And, well, where is that cotton going? It's going through the port of Charleston, the only southern port we're really going to want to think of in this discussion, because New Orleans is not a major import exporter for cotton. It's mostly through South Carolina and Charleston. And it's also going on railways from the south to the north, through the various ports in the north, because it's going to be finished into clothing and a variety of other textiles are shipped throughout the world. So cotton is very, very important to the American economy. So the North is as dependent at, on, on cotton as the South is. The only thing that holds the North and the South together, besides cotton, is this idea of expansion. Now you will hear that uh, Northerners were against slavery, and yes, the, uh, the center for abolition was certainly in the North. And you will hear that the South is pro-slavery, and yes, slavery dominated the southern cotton industry. And we're going to take a look at those ideas and see where is the reality in that. Did every southern own a slave? Was every northern an abolitionist? So I'm going to take a look at that interesting connection between the two. One of the reasons why the South grew dependent on slavery and cotton was because it could. The South was very geographically different from the North, and is very geographically different from the North. It has one major river, and that's the Mississippi River, and basically a bunch of smaller rivers that don't do them a lot in terms of transporting goods. The northern part of the country has a variety of rivers, all the tributaries into the Mississippi, the Great Lakes, and a canal system that's going to be built as a result of Henry Clay's American system. So the idea of building cities and factories is more suited to the North, and the idea of growing agricultural products, in this case cotton, is more suitable to the South. You could grow year-round in the South. You didn't necessarily grow cotton year-round, but you cultivate the fields to continue this engine of cotton 
in the South year round. Whereas if you had slaves in the North, what would they do in the winter? Shovel snow. So economically, slavery wasn't viable in the North, and it was very viable in the South because whether they were picking cotton or whether they were planting cotton, they were still able to work in the fields year round. Also, the lack of these big navigable rivers meant there weren't going to be large cities in the South, which meant there weren't going to be large ports because cities were built on ports. And they were going to be very dependent on this cash crop, which was cotton. So would slavery have thrived in the North if the climate had been different year round? It's hard to say. There certainly were slaves early on in American history in the North. Soldier of Truth is a good example. She was an apple slave in upstate New York. There were slaves in the North, and they worked in the apple fields, and they helped produce a variety of products, but that died out very quickly because economically it wasn't feasible to maintain them throughout the, uh, the tough winters in the northern part of the country. So cotton was the economic engine of the South. Uh, it came from this idea we had this raw material that is going to be shipped to the North, where it's going to be made into a finished material, and then sold back to the South. Now, if you think about that, for example, for a, a second, if you think about the idea that the South is growing this raw material and shipping it to the North, the North is then turning around and finishing it and turning it into clothing and other you know, sheets and the like and other textiles for use around the house, well, they're shipping that back to the South or they're shipping it to Europe. So the North is making a profit by shipping the finished textiles to Europe and the North is making a, product, uh, a profit by shipping the finished textiles back south. So the south is actually losing money in every transaction involving cotton going to the north because they're selling it to the north cheaply. The north is turning into finished goods and selling it back at a much greater price. So th this is a very unequal balance of trade between the south and the north. The south is losing in every transaction. The northern mills depended on southern cotton. So the north is actually dependent on the cotton being produced by the slaves and there's infrastructure being built to transport that cotton in terms of all of the port cities on the east coast of the United States and the railways that will ultimately develop, be developed that run from the north to the south and once again back to the south to the north. So we go a little further here, you take a look at what's financing all of this. Well, northern bankers are financing it. Northern bankers are supporting the building of the north-south railroads. Northern bankers are supporting the building of the ports. Northern bankers are supporting the building of the canal system. Northern bankers are supporting the extension of the plantation system by loaning money to the southern aristocrats who would turn around and expand their plantations on borrowed money. They would buy more seed on borrowed money. So in a way, the northern banks are also supporting slavery. Because when money is lent to a, a slave owner, uh, you know, that's on those plantation, large plantation in the South, the Northern Bank isn't watching where the money is actually going. They don't care because they're being repaid with interest. So this whole idea that the North is all about freedom and abolition and the South is all about slavery is kind of ridiculous. It's an insidious, almost incestuous relationship between the North and the South over slavery. Yes. In the North, there's a strong abolition movement, and there are many Northerners who are against slavery, but there are also many Southerners who are against slavery, because slaves are expensive, for one. We don't have to go into the whole moral argument about slavery, but they're expensive. And if they're expensive, that's going to put some people who have money at a decided advantage over the people who don't have money, who will be the Southern growers. So that's going to create an interesting relationship as well. So the idea that the North existed in isolation from slavery is kind of silly because where are they getting their product to finish into finished clothing and into various textiles? They're getting it from the South. So a little further here, I want to take a look. The North, as I said, the South had a negative balance of trade with the North. It's an ugly secret here that Northern business interests supported slavery. And in a way, the South becomes a colony to the North. And this is the order they're going to proceed. So this introduction showing the relationship with the South and the North over slavery, you're going to take a look at an Excel spreadsheet, which I'm going to queue up in a second, showing what's happening in the North and what's happening in the South in the early part of the 1800s. 
We're going to take a look at a slave chart showing the growth of slavery in the United States. We're going to take a look at a PowerPoint based on Chapter 11 in Farragher's Out of Many. And then you're going to take a look at a series of questions based on Farragher's uh, Out of Many in Chapter 11 as well. All having to do with the same topic. And then we're going to march right into Chapter 12 and kind of continue along the same line. So it's going to be several of these PowerPoints. At this point, I'm going to pause and I'm going to queue up this spreadsheet so you can take a look at it. What I have behind me is a spreadsheet showing developmental aspects of the South and the North from the War of 1812 to about 1850. It may be a little difficult to see in this presentation, but the spreadsheet will also be in the folder on the website under Topic 8. But just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about here. On the, set, on, the, on the upper part of the set, the northern economy, and on the bottom part of the southern economy. Uh, it starts in 1812. The War of 1812 begins, and at the same time, cotton production increases. All right. There are 1.2 million slaves in the United States at that time. The cotton gin was invented back in 1793 by Eli Whitney and Catherine Green. Um, Catherine Green was the wife of Nathaniel Green, a uh, Revolutionary War general, and uh, women weren't allowed to hold patents. So she worked side by side with Eli Whitney to develop the cotton gin, and once the cotton gin was developed, it allowed m not more cotton to be grown, but more finished cotton to be produced faster, which would lead to more cotton being grown. So if you can produce more finished cotton, that means cotton free of seeds, and there wasn't blood all over from slaves trying to pick the seeds out and getting blood all over it, you'd be able to ultimately get more cotton out of your fields and ship it to the north. So 1.2 million slaves in 1812, the War of 1812 begins. 1813, we get the uh, textile mills in Massachusetts. Uh, they're in Waltham, Massachusetts, and they're going to contribute later to what's called Lowell Mills. And in 1817, we have four million yards of cotton produced in the north. Now, where are they getting that cotton? Now, when I say yards produced, what I mean is finished yards of cotton, rolls of cotton that can be used to make into clothing, the finished textile. Well, if the north is now developing their mills, I guess we need more cotton. And the plantations expand in the south to provide more cotton. Manufacturing is beginning in the north. We have this idea of surplus. There are no banking regulations, and the market revolution is going on. So now we go a little further, and we get to 1819, the bank panic. We all know, we don't know about that. The first Pennsylvania coal mines in 1820. And in 1820 in the South, we have now 1.5 million slaves. What you'll notice is the North is developing technologically, while the South is continuing simply to grow cotton. Moving a little further, in the middle of the 1820s, we have the Lowell Mills. And what do we have down south? We have Denmark Vesey's Rebellion. We have slave rebellions going on. Um, as a result of that, slaves were not allowed to read and write. And there were regulations passed controlling where they could travel and how they could gather. And, oh, by the way, there's two million slaves in 1830 in the south, while we are continuing to develop in the north. Women are starting to became, become wage earners. The factory system is continuing to develop. And in 1831, we have Nat Turner's rebellion in the South. And that's the one where Nat Turner, uh, with about 75 accomplices, goes on his rampage and kills 51 people in Virginia. And they debate what to do once he's captured. He lives in the woods for a while, is eventually captured and hanged, along with uh, 20 other of his conspirators. So if you're watching carefully, there's very little going on in the South that's not slave or cotton related, but in the North, now we have the Reaper invented, we have the Revolver invented, we can talk all day whether that's a good idea or not. And in 1840, we have 2.5 million slaves in the South. In the North, we have, oh, we have millions of yards of cotton being produced based on that slavery. And a strange thing, according to the census in 1845, 64% of Southerners did not own slaves. What does that mean? That means most Southerners didn't own slaves. Most Southerners didn't own slaves, but we're all raised that every Southerner owned a slave. And Northerners, Northerners are doing pretty well here because who's to say the profits that are being made from the mill system are not being used to invest 
in other capital ventures and in other businesses and in other inventions. So the North is developing a varied society while the South is developing a cash crop economy. So where is this going to go? How is it logical if this proceeds? Well, the North is going to become a world trade center, a world trading center, as you know, world trade center, certainly a world trading center, and the South can grow cotton. The North is going to develop a viable banking system, making a lot of interest off of invest investments, and the South is going to grow cotton. Eventually, the South has to run out of money because each transaction is costing it while the North is developing a very varied economy and the South continues with a cash crop of cotton. I want to take a look at another thing, so I'm going to pause here. This is just a collection of facts and figures, if you like, relating to what's happening in the North and the South. They're disjointed. They're disjointed on purpose because I want it to be a snapshot. So let's just take a look. In 1812, there were 1.2 million slaves in the South. Henry Clay's American system helped build the infrastructure in the U.S., such as the National Road, some canals and railroads, predominantly in the Northeast. South slaves, Northeast developing. In 1817, four million yards of finished cotton were produced in the North. Well, where'd that cotton come from? As a result of the War of 1812, Southern cotton was able to expand beyond the Mississippi. Well, why? Why, as a result of the War of 1812, was were the plantation owners and southern cotton able to expand? Well, because the British are gone. The British are gone from the frontier because if you remember one of the instigators of the War of 1812 was the fact that the British were actually still on our frontier and they were supplying our enemies, Native Americans, with weapons. So they're gone. So now the march to west begins. And one of the interesting things about cotton is cotton requires more and more land. Cotton robs the soil of nitrogen. And as it burns up the soil, you have to continue to head further and further west to gain more soil. And what do you do about the burned up nitrogen, by the way? Well, they discovered you could plant peanuts. And peanuts would enrich the nitrogen in the soil. Don't ask me why. I don't know the reason why. I just know that that's what happened. Anyway, the market revolution begins during the Madison administration. So that's the whole trading thing and the idea of an infrastructure. But most of that is really affecting the North. In 1820, there were 1.5 million slaves in the South, and the first coal mine opened in the North. Again, now we have, we have sources of energy developing in the North and the technology to build mines while the South is continuing to rely on the cotton. Uh, we have the Denmark Vesey revolt in 1822. We have Lowell Mills open in 1826. This is a mill town in Lowell, Massachusetts, where women became the dominant part of the workforce, and it was a way for women to get off the farm. So we're starting to have advancement for women as well. It's going to turn ugly in Lowell. At first it goes very well. Women are paid very well. But pretty soon there's a lot of women coming into these mills. And what's going to happen is wages are going to be cut. And women are going to be overworked. And if you don't like it, there's the door. Uh, in 1830, now we have 2 million slaves in the United States. 1831, we have Nat Turner's Slave Rebellion in Virginia. So now, in comparison, between 1831 and 1837, the North produced the first Reaper, the Liberator, which is an abolitionist newspaper by Charles Finney, the Revolver, and started universal public education in Massachusetts with Horace Mann as the main proponent of that. So the North is expanding all kinds of way. By 1840, 323 million yards of finished cotton were being produced in northern mills. Well, where is that finished cotton coming from? Exactly. It's coming from the South. In 1840, there were 2.5 million slaves in the South. And by 1845, there were 3.2 million slaves in the South. There were about 12 million free people in, in the South, and there were about 3 million slaves in the South. So the total of about 15 million people, you had 3.2 million slaves. 64% of Southerners didn't own a slave. Slaves were expensive. Most Southerners were called yeoman farmers, Y-E-O-M-A-N. And they had small farms, and they were just subsistence farmers, occasionally producing a little extra surplus to sell. Owning a slave was a status symbol. And it also was a sign of wealth. Well, if you have money for the status symbol, maybe you own the slave. If you have the wealth, you definitely own the slaves. But, but it wasn't the numbers that we tend to think of. Most Southerners were not slave owners. They were, as I said, they were yeomen or small independent farmers. 2.5% of slave owners owned 
50 or more slaves. They were that expensive. So this idea of these big plantations with many, many happy slaves or many unhappy slaves, depending on the plantation, were, it was a very isolated idea and the, the, whole, the whole embellishment of it, largely due to Hollywood and to a lot of northern propaganda. Slavery was terrible, it was horrible, there's no doubt about it. But the numbers are not what we believe it to be. There were a lot of people involved in slavery, but a lot of slaves were owned by a select few people. Cherokee Indians, strangely enough, owned slaves in the Western South, as did some of the other civilized tribes. When the Cherokees were displaced in, as part of the Trail of Tears, and they were moved to Oklahoma, they adopted the ways of Southerners, and they became slave owners. That's an amazing thing. Can you imagine being owned by a Cherokee Indian in the 1840s? You must have thought your life really sucked. Now it gets even better. It gets even better because blacks own slaves. Actually, blacks own slaves in a disproportionate amount to their number in the population. I'll show you an article about that in just a second. And the other thing that we don't often think about is there were free blacks in the South. By 1860, there were 261,988 free blacks in the South. And they were doing a variety of jobs. Most of the jobs were manual, meaning there were jobs working with their hands. So they were blacksmiths, they were carpenters, they were masons, they did work in the fields, they worked in stores as labor in stores. But the point is, there were a significant amount of free blacks in the South. This is a chart I wanted to share with you. On the left-hand side, you have the census year, and then you have the number of slaves, the number of free blacks, the total black, percentage of free blacks, total U.S. population, and the percentage of, black, of blacks of the total population. I'm not going to go through the whole chart with you. It's available once again as part of this note set. But if you just take a look, the amount of slaves just grows incredibly to almost 4 million slaves in 1860 and, of course, drops in 1870 as a result of the 13th Amendment in 1865. What's also happening is the percentage of the number of free blacks is growing. Blacks could earn their freedom a number of ways. They could work to a given age, and that was state by state. There were state regulations concerning slavery. They could purchase their freedom. In some cases, the masters allowed slaves to work in their off time, doing a variety of manual tasks. Their freedom could be purchased by another person, and they could be set free, or if the master felt like it for any of one of a variety of reasons, they could emancipate a slave. The most typical reason was if the slave had grown too old to work, and that would have been someplace by the age of about 35, the slave would be granted his freedom because he was useless to the master. Now, of course, he was useless to himself as well. He wasn't going to be hired at that age, and a lot of those slaves actually died in poverty. Or the slave could have done something that really benefited the master, such as saving the master's life or saving a member of the master's family in some way. So slaves could be emancipated for a variety of reasons. You start to look across, you see the numbers are really staggering as you go across. In 1860, the total U.S. population was 31,443,000. Of that number, 14% of the population was black. So, you can take a look at this and you can draw other conclusions from it. This is an article I actually wanted to read with you. Dixie Censored Subject, Black Slave Owners by Robert M. Brooms, 1997. Uh, it's cited at the bottom, you can also take a closer look at it. But, it said, goes on to start. In an 1856 letter to his wife, Mary Custis Lee, Robert E. Lee called slavery a moral and political evil. Yet, he concluded that black slaves were immeasurably better off than in Africa, morally, socially, and physically. So Robert E. Lee, who will be the general of the Confederate Army, the commander of the Confederate Army, he thinks slavery is bad. But he also thinks that slaves are better off as slaves in America than if they were actually free. The fact is, large numbers of free Negroes own black slaves. In fact, in numbers disproportionate to their representation in society at large. In 1860, only a small minority of whites owned slaves. According to the U.S. Census report for that last year before the Civil War, there were nearly 27 million whites in the country. Some 8 million of them live in the slave-holding states. So roughly about a third of the whites in the country live in the slave-holding states. The census also determined that there were fewer than 385,000 individuals who owned slaves. 
Even if all slave owners had been white, that would amount to only 1.4% of whites in the country, or 4.8% of southern whites owning one or more slaves. My point in showing this to you and going through the line by line is, yes, there were a lot of slaves, but they were owned by a relatively few amount of people. So when we blame the entire South for slavery, we're largely incorrect. That's a falsehood. In rare instances, when the ownership of slaves by free Negroes is acknowledged in the history books, justification centers on the claim that black slave masters were simply individuals who purchased the freedom of a spouse or child from a white slave holder and had been unable to legally manumit them. That means to emancipate them. Although this did indeed happen at times, it is a misrepresentation of the majority of instances, one which is debunked by records of the period on blacks who owned slaves. These include individuals such as Justice Angel and Mistress L. Harry of Colleton District, South Carolina, who each owned 84 slaves in 1830. In fact, in 1830, a fourth of the free Negro slave masters in South Carolina owned 10 or more slaves, eight owning 30 or more. According to the Federal Census Report on June 1, 1860, there were nearly 4.5 million Negroes in the United States, with fewer than 4 million of them living in the southern slaveholding states. Of the blacks residing in the South, 261,988 were not slaves. Of this number, 10,689 lived in New Orleans. The country's leading African-American historian, Duke University professor John Hope Franklin, records that in New Orleans, over 3,000 free Negroes owned slaves, or 28% of the free Negroes in that city. So there were black slave owners. So yes, again, slavery is a big, ugly thing, but it's uglier when we start thinking about it wasn't just whites owning slaves, and it's also uglier when we think about we blame a majority of the southern population for slave owning when they didn't own slaves in the first place. That's not to say, by the way, that a majority of the southerners would not have wanted to own slaves, or that 64% who didn't own slaves, maybe they wanted to own them. I don't know about that one, but they were expensive. So the fact is that two-thirds of southerners did not own any slaves. To return to the census figures quoted above, this 28% is certainly impressive when compared to less than 1.4% of all African American, of, of American whites and less than 4.8% of Southern whites. The statistics show that when free, blacks disproportionately became slave masters. So <clears throat> relative to the, no the number in population, the amount of black slave owners was actually higher than white slave owners, which is a really strange idea if you, you know, want to take a look at it like that. So I'm going to leave this here, and I'm going to have a se separate PowerPoint presentation coming up. It'll be topic eight, number two, to be continued. See you in a few minutes.